Star Citizen has flown under the radar quite a bit since its inception way back in 2012. That's pretty surprising given it has a loud fanbase and just as many vocal detractors ready to tear it and creator Chris Roberts to pieces every time he farts. And when you consider Star Citizen as the highest crowdfunding campaign of all time, then it becomes apparent that this isn't something the mainstream gaming community should be ignoring. I made a video on Star Citizen about two years ago and, well, let's just say it didn't go over very well. So I'll be completely remaking that video and giving you a more complete overview of the history of Star Citizen, starting with its creator and working our way to today. Strap yourselves in, everybody. This is going to be a bumpy ride. First of all, you can't talk about Star Citizen without talking about Chris Roberts or Wing Commander, or the prevalence of nostalgia-driven video game campaigns on Kickstarter. Chris Roberts is the mastermind behind the Wing Commander franchise, a series of space combat simulators that were massively popular in the PC gaming community during the 1990s. Game development often requires massive teams of people, and while Wing Commander is no different, the series really was Roberts' baby, so much so that when the game got a movie adaptation, he directed it himself. It was terrible, but it really speaks to Roberts' dedication to the franchise. Shortly before the Wing Commander movie, Roberts left developer Origin Systems and the Wing Commander franchise with it, except for the movie, obviously. Still, you can take the Roberts out of the space flight simulators, but you can't take the space flight simulators out of the Roberts. Or is that the other way around? His next three games, Star Lancer, Conquest, Frontier Wars, and Freelancer, were all pretty much Wing Commander games with a different coat of paint and a name change. But Roberts eventually wanted something different. He left gaming in 2003 to focus on producing films, creating such classic movies as Lord of War, Lucky Number Slevin, and Edison. Ugh. He returned to gaming in 2011 when he founded Cloud Imperium Games, and they immediately began work on Star Citizen, a Cooking Mama-style game set in a colorful wonderland. Oh no, no, it's a space flight simulator. After Double Fine Adventure, Roberts decided to ride the wave of success on Kickstarter, and launched a campaign for Star Citizen on October 18th, 2012. How'd it do? Well, it would become the highest funded, crowdfunded game in history, though most of it didn't actually come from Kickstarter, even though it raised $2.1 million on Kickstarter. How was that possible, and how did the campaign do so well? You want me to learn your name? Do what I say and live long enough for me to care. That's your Gladius. You ready? Ready as I'll ever be. We'll find out, sir. Let's go. Star Citizen was announced on October 10th, over a week before its Kickstarter went live. IGN described the game as a space combat game where you're not just a ship in a universe, but a person living a second life in a galaxy full of possibilities. Yet even before that, on October 2nd, Roberts gave an interview with GameSpot. He said he already arranged private funding for a game he was working on, although such an agreement was apparently scrapped after the success of the crowdfunding campaign, according to an interview he gave with Kotaku UK in 2016. Still, this initial interview with GameSpot is something of a timepiece. This was only a few months after Double Fine popularized Kickstarter with Double Fine Adventure. And back then, every developer's big selling point on the platform was how big publishers and investors only got in the way of those developers, forcing them to cut corners and change their vision. Kickstarter would allow them to create games without having to answer to anybody but the fans. In fact, as Roberts himself put it, The appetite of the big publishers to take a chance, it's like the movie business. It's all about these huge, big events in the movie business. And it's all about these huge, big events in the game business. They want to do fewer titles, they want to do games that cost a lot of money, they want to have them all on very safe existing brands. So it's great if you're doing another Call of Duty. It's this kind of talk that got a lot of games on Kickstarter funded back then, including Double Fine Adventure as well as Roberts' own game. There's certainly a lot of truth to the sentiment, but another thing a publisher does is keep a project in line with a set budget and deadline, something that doesn't exist when you self-publish or use crowdfunding. That's something that became painfully obvious for everyone after years of Kickstarter campaigns that never delivered, as well as with Star Citizen. When the campaign finally launched, it promised a lot. 
The Kickstarter page is bursting at the seams, detailing planned gameplay features, and that's before we even get to the section about why Roberts and his company is seeking crowdfunding, or details on the rewards. I could be here all day talking about this page, so I'll just go over some of the highlights. Once you get past all the stuff that was added after the success of the campaign, you get into the meat of the original pitch. The full description, the title reads, and this section pretty much echoes what Robert said in that GameSpot interview. How big publishers force developers to compromise on their vision, and that they're gonna show the world that creators are always right. Star Citizen brings the visceral action of piloting interstellar craft through combat and exploration to a new generation of gamers at a level of fidelity never before seen. At its core, Star Citizen is a destination, not a one-off story. It's a complete universe where any number of adventures can take place, allowing players to decide their own game experience. Keep that last sentence in mind. Star Citizen is not a one-off story, it's a whole, complex universe and will be treated as such. That would prove to be one of the core tenets of the entire development process. Next up is the Star Citizen Rundown section, and this is the bulk of the campaign, listing every single gameplay aspect they hope to include. A huge universe to explore, a constantly expanding universe, and micro-updates rule. These three starting points are the core foundation of the Star Citizen experience, if you want to call it that. We're committed to making Star Citizen a living, breathing universe that is its own entity. It will be a constantly shifting and evolving place for players to explore and affect. We're not interested in having yearly updates. Once live, we will have a team of people adding content on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So we'll always be adding data, stories, and campaigns, as well as reacting to the needs and actions of the players. It was clear that Star Citizen wouldn't just be released and be done forever, or even booted out into early access and get a few updates here and there until a full release. No, instead, the aim was to constantly release update after update after update to the game for the foreseeable future, also something he talked about in his pre-launch GameSpot interview. In the old days of making games, you built everything, put it on discs, it went out to be shipped to a store. You hoped people like it, then they played it for a month or a week, and then you're off for another three years making a game. As we would come to see years later, he wasn't kidding. In its current early access form, if you can even call it that, Cloud Imperium have constantly been releasing updates, big and small, adding, tweaking, and even removing certain gameplay aspects to suit the feedback from the fans. Of course, that's not all that revolutionary these days, as just about everyone does that to some degree, but back in 2012, this was a huge deal. The idea of a developer, especially a well-known and beloved one like Chris Roberts, actually listening to fan feedback and producing a constant string of updates based on that feedback? was just mind-blowing back then. I guess you could say Roberts was ahead of his time in that respect. The studio was also ahead of its time with microtransactions. Cloud Imperium made a big deal about how even though this would be an online MMO, there would be no subscription fee, just a one-time purchase of the game itself. In fact, at the top of the page, it proudly says, no subscription and no pay to win. The workaround, of course, would be microtransactions for in-game cosmetics. There's no mention of these microtransactions anywhere on the Kickstarter page, however they were mentioned in several articles ahead of the Kickstarter itself, including on Cinema Blend and Engadget. Microtransactions weren't anything new even in 2012, but the fact that they weren't mentioned anywhere on the Kickstarter page is telling. In November 2017, Cloud Imperium started selling in-game plots of lands on random planets for 50 to 100 real-world dollars for the right for players to build bases there. There are also third-party sites like Starhanger.com that sells in-game spaceships for hundreds of real-world dollars. Or you could just go to Chris Roberts' own website, Roberts Space Industries, and spend just as much on in-game ships there. There you can also subscribe to one of two monthly services that will grant you a whole bunch of extras. Or you can buy gift cards, t-shirts, in-game currency, or a $5 fee to change your account name. None of this is ever mentioned anywhere on the Kickstarter page. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Back to the Kickstarter page itself, and the next bullet point is for Squadron 42. This was described as a Wing Commander style single player mode that would be playable offline. 
This isn't explicitly stated anywhere on the Kickstarter page, but Roberts would later go on to say that Squadron 42 was, at least originally, intended to be part of Star Citizen. Nobody could have possibly have known this back then, but this would be one of the biggest sources of contention for a lot of people, as Squadron 42 would eventually be spun off into its own game. The rest of the page goes into even more detail about the game just like this. There would be an elite squad that the best players would be invited to called 42nd Squadron, a military service term your character can complete, and upon completion you can find yourself a new job, promises of an entire universe changing based on your actions, history books being rewritten, user-generated content, multiple planets to visit and factions to join, fight, or ally with, a dynamic economy depending on your actions and the actions of factions a million miles away you've never seen or heard of, and of players you'll never meet on the other side of the galaxy changing the world and doing everything you're doing. Multiple jobs, ships with their own AI and handling and customization, all of which coming in different sizes with different weapons and different customization options, hundreds of subcomponents on ships that you can tinker with, massive scales, huge space battles, VR support. <sighs> the game was promising a lot. Good god, this Kickstarter campaign was promising absolutely everything under the sun. And beyond the sun. Cause space. It's safe to say that Star Citizen is the most ambitious video game in history. Given how much they want to pull off and the fact that they wanted to do this via crowdfunding, I think it's safe to say Roberts and his team bit off a little bit more than they could chew. I mean, come on, Peter Molyneux is thinking they're promising too much here. I think nothing summarizes that feeling better than the part that promises 10 times the detail of current AAA games. I mean, come on, really, come on. You want to create what will be the deepest video game experience ever devised, likely ever to be devised, release constant micro-updates on a perpetual basis for years and years to keep the experience fresh, you want it to be the best looking game ever made, and you want to do all of that off the back of one Kickstarter campaign and no monthly or yearly subscription fee on top of that? Well, not quite, the answer would turn out to be. Roberts was serious when he decided he was going to completely shake up the way games are made. See, this is where this entire thing becomes really intimidating, and why I was so hesitant to do these videos for so long. At the same time as the Kickstarter campaign, Chris Roberts launched a second crowdfunding campaign for Star Citizen on his website. RobertSpaceIndustries.com. Now, let's not beat around the bush here because I think we all know how this went. As of today, February 27th, 2018, the day I'm writing this script, there are currently 1.98 million backers on this second campaign, donating a total of 179.3 million dollars to Star Citizen. Let me just say that again. Almost 2 million people have donated almost 180 million dollars to Star Citizen on this random website. Well, it's not really random, but you know what I mean. Um, are, are you okay? Do you, do you need me to get you some water or something? You look a little pale, huh? Um, they are there? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know that's pretty crazy, but, um, that is kind of what we're dealing with here, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I, oh, I, I think I need to sit down myself, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, t to put that in perspective, it was March 4th, 2014, four years ago, that the Guinness Book of World Records recognized Star Citizen as the highest funded crowdfunding campaign ever. Not the highest video game campaign, the highest crowdfunded anything. Ever. Four years ago. And if we're talking purely development cost and not also marketing, Star Citizen is on its way to being the most expensive video game ever made. Close to Star Wars The Old Republic's 200 million and blowing past Destiny's 140 million and Grand Theft Auto V's 137 million dollars. See, we've uh, we've upgraded the uh, the the whole sort of jump effects and everything using the new GPU particle system that's coming in with 3.0. Yeah, again, yeah, another thing that we've added, which. You
Let's get back into it by going back in time to October 2012 when the Kickstarter campaign was launched. Roberts sounded like he was absolutely out of his mind with all these grand declarations about what Star Citizen would be. True, he was a big wig movie producer and likely had his own cash to spend, and he was originally talking to outside investors, but for what he was promising to deliver via Kickstarter funds and whatever else he was going to get on his website seemed ludicrous. Well, it turned out it was the naysayers who were the ludicrous ones. In fact, in some ways, raising the money on your own website might be the way to go. Not only has Cloud Imperium raised well, more money than everyone watching this video combined will ever see, but so too has Introversion Software, who raised $19 million for Prison Architect in 2015 using the same method. When you see numbers like that, having a massive universe full of spaceships the size of the sun that you can customize every individual nut and bolt for doesn't sound so ridiculous. Okay, it does, but because that sounds boring, not because they wouldn't have the money to let you do that. Today, Robert's site lists all the stretch goals the game's had over the years. When you read the smaller tiers, it almost seems quaint. $2.5 million will enable a new flyable ship, $3.5 million will allow customizable cockpits, and $5 million allows for enhanced boarding actions, like melee combat, ooh! It's kind of cute to see that, and then compare it to the last stretch goal met, $65 million, which greatly enhances ship modularity. Ooh, even better. With how well the campaign is doing these days, it should come as no surprise that the Kickstarter campaign cleaned house. The Kickstarter closed on November 19th, 2012, raising $2,134,000. $374. I wonder how much money the Kickstarter would have raised if it weren't for the simultaneous campaign on Roberts' site. By the same token, I'm curious as to why Roberts felt the need to do the Kickstarter campaign at all. Maybe he wasn't confident people would donate to him directly, and that they'd prefer a third party between themselves and the creator. And I'm also curious if Roberts had any idea if the campaign would go as well as it has, given how crazy deep he wants the game to be, or if it just kind of spiraled into being that deep because it was so popular. It must be said, it was a well-run campaign, too. There are plenty of videos showing what Cloud Imperium had developed up to that point, and as we discussed at great length, the page was full of detail about what the game would be, and there were a whopping 47 updates on the Kickstarter during the campaign. You know, there's probably a joke in there somewhere, but after the shit I got from my last Star Citizen video, I'm walking on eggshells right now. Saying that didn't help, did it? A day after the Kickstarter campaign ended, Cloud Imperium posted a document called The Pledge in a new update. It's the kind of marketing thing you'd expect from a developer or even a publisher, saying they appreciate that you trusted them to give them your money and that they're going to work hard to earn that trust, you know, the usual. But there are two paragraphs that stand out to me. We, the developer, intend to treat you with the same respect we would give a publisher. You will receive regular updates about the progress of the game. We will do a show and tell for each major milestone. Your voice will be heard and represented in our development docs and our feature wish list. You will see art and video and learn how we intend to implement gameplay mechanics well before the rest of the world. The website will be updated and the community will be maintained. There may be delays and there may be changes. We recognize that such things are inevitable and would be lying to you if we claimed otherwise. But when this happens, we will treat you with the respect you deserve rather than spending your money on public relations. When we need to change a mechanic or alter something you believe should be in the game, we will tell you exactly why. Just keep those two paragraphs in mind over the next couple of parts because delays and promises of regular updates will come up again and again and again, and again. Twenty thirteen turned out to be a relatively quiet year for Star Citizen. Cloud Imperium kept their heads down and continued working on the game, and the independent crowdfunding campaign continued collecting new donations. But there are three major events that happened in this year that, while not big deals on their own or even seen as all that important back then, would turn out to be pivotal moments. The first came on April 6, 2013, in what would be the final update on the Star Citizen Kickstarter page. The update, quite frankly, is garbage. It has nothing to do with Star Citizen at all, it's actually just an ad for Shroud of the Avatar's Kickstarter campaign and an in-game item that was designed by Chris Roberts. That's it. 
This was the first update on the Kickstarter page since February of that year, and that was just a reminder about signing up to Roberts' website to get a customized Star Citizen card of some sort. Clearly, Cloud Imperium's interest in the Kickstarter page had completely dissipated since its successful run half a year earlier. The second event was on August 29th, 2013, when Cloud Imperium released what would become one of several pre-release modules for the game, this one called Hangar Mode. This was exactly what it says on the tin, a virtual hangar in which you can walk around and look at spaceships, and that's it, actually. That, that was all the mode was. I should point out at this juncture that Roberts promised a 2014 release date for Star Citizen, and by late 2013, he and his company had nothing to show for themselves, but a small room you could walk around in and no updates. Finally, the third noteworthy event of the year was the first annual StarCon on October 10th, a year to the day when the game was first publicly announced. This event, not to be confused with the science fiction convention of the same name in Russia, was pretty much just a live stream by Roberts and his team talking about progress of the game. This would eventually evolve into an actual convention over the coming years, but this inaugural version of the event served as a way to assuage the fears of backers and fans who were worried after Hangar Mode's less than stellar arrival. Still, despite all this, things were going relatively well for Star Citizen at the time. Double Fine was acting as a nice meat shield for any and all Kickstarter campaigns that might have otherwise drawn ire from backers, and development seemed to be progressing, however slowly. But oh, how quickly things would change come 2014. Support us on Patreon.com slash Clickist for more videos just like this, or visit us at Clickist.com for all the latest news, reviews, investigations, interviews, and opinion pieces on indie gaming. Thank you.